call the meeting door. Please stand for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. I'm going to go ahead and do the inv invocation, but I'm wanting to read something that I had gotten several years ago that I think is very, very touching and very true. It's entitled, Potato Chips. A little boy wanted to meet God. He knew it would be a long trip to where God lived, so he packed his suitcase with a bag of potato chips and a six-pack of root beer and started his journey. When he'd gone about three blocks, he met an old man. He was sitting in the park just staring at some pigeons. The boy sat down next to him and opened his suitcase. He was about to take a drink from his root beer and he noticed that the old man looked hungry. So he offered him some chips. He gratefully accepted and smiled at him. His smile was so pretty that the boy wanted to see it again. So he offered him a root beer. Again, he smiled. The boy was delighted. They sat there all afternoon eating and smiling, but they never said a word. As twilight approached, the boy realized how tired he was and he got up to leave. But before he'd gone more than a few steps, he turned uh, around and ran back to the old man and gave him a hug. He gave him his biggest smile ever. When the boy opened the door to his own house a short time later, his mother was surprised by the look of joy on his face. She asked him, <clears throat> what did you do today that made you so happy? He replied, I had lunch with God. But before his mother responded, he, he added, you know what? He's got the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the old man, also radiant with joy, returned to his home. His son was stunned by the look of peace on his face, and he asked, Dad, what did you do today that made you so happy? I ate potato chips in the park with God. However, before his son responded, he added, You know, he's much younger than I expected. Too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, and a kind word. Uh, under announcements... Um, we've got, as you see, if you saw when you came in, the six, this is the 16th anniversary of 9-11. A lot changed in our country in that, in that time. I do want to announce that I'd like to, I, being the mayor, would like to appoint a, uh, a special blue ribbon committee uh, to look into uh, two issues that we have that we really need to be focusing on, and that one is parking, and one is just uh, congestion downtown, and just to try to get some, some suggestions from some of the town lay people. Uh, this will not involve staff in any, in any way. Uh, I hope maybe we could have a couple of meetings, five or seven on this group, come to some consensus, give some recommendations, and then bring it back to the board and just let one of the, whoever the chairman of the committee is, present it to the board and let the board consider it. I also uh, called the Institute of Government uh, regarding my letters, and uh, I'd like to say that the Institute said that I had done nothing illegal, immoral, or improper. Uh, that's my announcements. Uh, we don't have many citizens here tonight uh, for citizens' comment, and obviously no one signed up. Up. Oh. Okay. Come right on up. September brings a change of season, hurricanes, and the East Buncombe Hard to Recycle Collection, and that's what I'm going to talk about. This special collection will be held for four hours this upcoming Saturday, September 16th from 10 to 2, once again at the Madden Ace Hardware in Swannanoa, in the section of a lot between Bank of America and Ingalls Gas. Now, this was the birthplace of the Hard to Recycle Collections. This popular event is free and open to any Buncombe County resident or small business. A sampling of the accepted items are books, cardboard, electronics, computers. There's a $10 fee for TVs and CRT monitors. Batteries, metals, appliances, packing styrofoam, building supplies, furniture, sporting goods, animal sanctuary items, and many more. The full list is 
Uh, you'll see these posted all around town on the different Bolton boards, and there are green copies of this list uh, on the table in the foyer, at the library, and at the chamber. So you refer to this, uh, what things are accepted. If you have any questions about something that's not on there or is on there, you contact the vendor on the left. And I suggest you do that in advance because uh, they set up early that morning. So you will, won't have to waste a trip or uh, unnecessary hauling. Um, so that's basically the scoop. And this is uh, ongoing. Uh, we started these events in 2011. Asheville Greenworks now take, uh, runs them. Uh, the flyer is also available on our website, rainbowrecycling.org and AshevilleGreenworks.org. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Bounty and Soul update. Bruce Granger, please come up. Bruce. That is just, I mean, I mean, that was just stunning. I mean, it didn't last very long, I mean, maybe a week or so, but boy, that, I mean, the state needs to be complimented on that. That was, that was one of the best things I've ever seen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Angela. Thank you so much for making this easy to do. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, I was reminded uh, on the drive over here from the office that uh, just over a year ago, I made this first sort of an update to you folks on Bounty and Soul and the work that we're doing. And um, during that evening, I pulled up to Town Hall and the parking lot was full and overflowing and people were everywhere and there was overflow in this hall and next door and down the hall. And it turned out that that evening there were two things on the agenda, me and a crematorium. <laughs> so um, I will take it from the citizens of Black Mountain that there are six or seven who enjoy hearing an update from Bounty and Soul, so I'm, but I appreciate it on a stormy night like this. Um, I want to just uh, bring you up to date on some things that have happened over the course of the last year. It's been an amazing year for us. And uh, I want to update you on the community impact and the, some of the work that we're doing now, the new work that's coming up uh, from Bounty and Soul. Uh, we are a nonprofit community benefit organization, creating healthier communities, providing fresh, healthy food, nutrition literacy, and health and wellness resources. We're committed to developing a cooperative model that can be used in communities where food insecurity and malnutrition exist. Over the course of the last year, we have had three other communities approach us about replicating this model for them. Uh, we're in the process of having conversations with them. Some of the work has been done to be able to create this. It's a scalable model. It's one that we hope to be able to do more in Eastern Buncombe and Western McDowell counties to be able to serve those communities. And it's, uh, it's working. And you'll see some of that as, we get in, as I get into more of my comments. give you an idea about hunger and food insecurity across Buncombe County, 91% of county residents do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. Maybe some of us in the room feel the same way, that we don't eat enough. But it's a significant issue, and a lot of it has to do with access, and it has to do with cost. Also across the community, one out of six people woke up this morning and did not know if, how, when they would next get a meal. That's what food insecurity looks like across Buncombe County. That totals 35,000 people in the population. And shockingly, that number rises to one out of four when we talk about children under the age of 18. So if we look at schools and the impact of education, it's no wonder teachers have drawers in their desks that are full of granola bars and things so that they can satisfy children, or that many of our schools are at virtually 100% free and reduced breakfast and lunch in the communities to just to be able to provide a learning environment for children where their stomachs are not getting in the way of their ability to learn and absorb lessons. It's a critical issue that we all face and Bounty and Soul is here to help with that. Across our participant marketplace, those who are attending our markets, nearly one in four client households have at least one member who is in poor health. And in many times, as I'll take you through some of the data to bear this out later, that's because of a lack of access of healthy, nutritious foods or having to make a trade-off between paying for your rent or buying food or paying your utilities or buying food or being able to put gas in your car to get to work or buying nutritious, healthy food. So those trade-offs are being made by people all over the community. 
88% of client households are buying the cheapest food available regardless of their health. The, the opportunity to be able to help settle a stomach, to satisfy me for now, so that I can move on and deal with the issues that I have in my life are prevalent across the population, the targets that, of the folks in, in, in the Swannanoa Valley community that we serve. A little bit about community impact. Bounty and Soul is the only as-needed food resource in the Swannanoa Valley. And let me qualify that for you. You can get lunch on Wednesday at the Methodist Church downtown. It's free if you don't have any money to pay for it or you contribute. You can get a lunch at the Methodist Church in Swannanoa one time a week. Swannanoa Valley Christian Ministries offers a very wonderful food resource and their food pantry, and we share food back and forth between us. But clients are only able to access that food pantry once every 21 days. At Bounty and Soul, our five weekly markets, our three public markets each week, we welcome anybody as often as they need. It's not unusual for people to come to our Tuesday market and then show up again on Friday evening at the elementary school because their household is large enough or their food resource and the insecurity they face is that prevalent that they need to come back multiple times and we welcome them to come. We've seen a 30% increase in participation in our market participation since January 1st, 30%. More than 50% of these participants have been with us less than one year. So the word is getting out about the work that we're doing, the access to healthy food, the nutrition education, the healthy meals, cooking demonstrations that we do, the health and wellness lessons that are provided, and people are being attracted for that. So it's not just food that's bringing them, but it's access to these other resources to help them live healthier lives. We've grown from one market to five markets in less than three years. So about three years ago, when Body and Soul was incorporated as a 501c3 organization, Ali Kasperian, the founder, was at St. James Episcopal Church with a table, a six-foot table, and some loose produce made available to the people who were at that time getting lunch at the welcome table. Well, that had now grew to three tables, it grew to five tables, it grew to a weekly market at St. James, and has now continued to expand to five weekly markets around the community. We're also sourcing, to keep up with that demand, we're also sourcing and distributing 25% more food now than we were in January. Because of the market participation, we've had to go out and find new sources of food. One of the places that we found is in the agricultural community in the Swannanoa Valley. We started a program last January that we called Plant a Row for Bounty and Soul. So we've gone to growers and farmers who at the time were planning what they were going to put in the ground and ask them, would you please plant an extra row for us? Many have responded. We continue to have a great partnership with the Dr. John Wilson Community Garden here. That great food keeps coming out, of, coming out and to us. Mayor Sobel has been a great donor to us from his, from his plot. But we have folks that are either planning with the intention of donating to us, or they're allowing us to come back into the farms and the fields, the orchards, after they've taken what they want and said, Bruce, whatever's there is yours. Come and get it. So we're doing that. We're looking for new opportunities to be able to provide the food resource necessary for the community. We also have, through the success that we found, and I'll statistically share some of this with you in a minute, we now have physicians who are referring their patients to us for this kind of solutions. We have cardiologists, we have internists, we have family practice people who are dealing with patients who have diabetes, high blood pressure, heart conditions, chronic illnesses that can be addressed by nutrition and a reliable, sustainable source of fresh fruits and vegetables. And we have instituted a health coaching program which has delivered significant results. But now that physicians are referring their patients to us, they are establishing a baseline with these patients. They come to us over a period of time, back to their physician for another reestablishment, and I would tell you that the results are shocking. More and more physicians on a weekly basis, I just met one yesterday, who didn't understand that this resource was available and over the course of this next week or two is going to refer three of his patients to us because he understands that it's not just the access to the fresh food, the fruits and vegetables, but it's all of the nutrition education and the health and wellness lessons. To really address the whole person is why it's so significant. And on an individual basis, when I got here, just actually it was a year ago tomorrow, uh, was my first day on the job. Um, when I got here, one of the questions I asked was, how do you know you're successful? 
well, you know, folks come up and tell us they feel better. Or, but it's not unusual for us to have a market participant come to us and say, I went to my doctor for my annual checkup, and he took me off my diabetes medication, my heart medication, my blood pressure, my cholesterol medication, because of the impact that this is having. So we conducted a study through the University of Asheville Health and Wellness Department, and these are the results that they brought back to us. Among the 105 market participants that they surveyed over the course of a week, 86% reduced the number of meals skipped due to financial concerns. We meet parents every week at our markets who are not eating a meal during the day so their children can. We've been able to help reduce that in those families. 89% experienced significant increase in physical activity and energy. 91% improved increased the practice of self-care. Self-care, the ability to say, I've got to take care of myself so that I can take care of my children or my families or I'm well enough to be able to work without having to be at risk of an on-work accident. 91% improved or reduced their weight. 59% reduced the amount of medication taken. And I would tell you many of those people in there came off of their medication altogether. 97% re reported overall improvement in their health. All five of our markets create community. And this is what I mean by that. If you were at Blue Ridge Apartments this evening for our distribution, or you come to St. James tomorrow midday to see why that distribution takes place. People line up hours in advance of the events themselves to meet with and mingle with the people who are there with them. Many times they're folks they didn't know before they came to a Bounty and Soul event, but they begin to build a community. They start to learn together. Hey, did you, I tried this and now it worked. Now, how are you doing? One of my favorite stories of this is on Flat, on, on Flat Creek Road, just north of the Black Mountain Elementary School, there are two low-income mobile home centers. We had two senior elderly single women who lived three, four trailers apart from each other for years, had never met each other. Met each other at the Black Mountain Elementary School, and now they watch out for each other. They come to the markets together. If one can't come, the other picks up food for them. We are building community within these markets so that folks can continue to reinforce and, and work with each other on, the, on the, um, the resources that they're getting and the education that they're getting. We're currently distributing over 7,500 pounds of healthy food to over 700 people each week. As I mentioned to you earlier, the numbers of people at the market has increased by 30%, and the amount of food that we are sourcing and distributing, thanks to God, to be able to support that increased participation in the markets is up 25%. At every week, 51 weeks out of 52, at the market schedule that's in the, in the inside of the flyer that I provided to you, we're there 51 weeks out of 52. With these resources, with these education materials, with a varying and rotating curriculum so that we're addressing the whole person and helping them understand how food can be a tool for stress management, for brain health. This month we're doing a, a seminar on financial health because many times financial health becomes an issue in their ability to access food. So the health and wellness, the healthy cooking demonstrations all becomes a way to treat and address the issues of the whole person. Produce to the people is what we call the distribution of this food. The five mobile markets, you'll, you'll see this funky green truck, this retro 60 looking thing rattling around on the streets in Asheville at uh, Publix and at Walmart and at Sam's Club and at the Mana Food Bank and you'll see it out and about in the community picking up food from local farmers and growers. So that we're gathering food and then we're turning it back out into the community and if you come to a market you would see that that looks is very representative of the abundance that's at every market. So it's not just a whole bunch of potatoes. It's a wide variety. Imagine you're wandering through the Ingalls produce section. That's what it looks like at our markets. Whole grains, fresh produce, resources to be able to tell somebody how to cook a rutabaga. I didn't even know, and I grew up on a farm, but Ali Kasparian had me three recipes on what to do with a rutabaga, and they were all good, and they were simple. Produce to the people is the way we go out in a mobile market and reach out into the community and take food and make it accessible to people who may otherwise not have access to it. Rooted in Health is what we call our, our health and wellness and our nutrition education programs. It also includes things like 
gentle movement and yoga that is offered free to people on Tuesdays at St. James and on Saturday mornings at the library. We offer twice weekly Zumba classes. We did one on Tuesday evening at St. James and it was so popular, we started another one on Thursday evenings. So now we offer two, getting people out in movement as a part of their wellness. It also includes our cooking instructions and our, and our health and wellness resources. And I'll tell you about one program that we're particularly excited about here. Um, there is work going on to renovate the kitchen at the Carver Center. And what we're looking for is an opportunity to participate in the curriculum that's involved there to teach people about, thing, about healthy, nutritious cooking, health and wellness lessons and education. We're looking at the opportunity to perhaps preserve crops that come out of the ground. So if I've got a bumper crop of tomatoes, let me teach you how to can them and preserve them. We're looking at that as a possibility for Bounty and Soul so that in the December, January time frame, when not much produce is coming out of the ground, we have been able to sort of put a store of foods away, healthy, nutritious foods, that we can bring back out and move into the distributions going forward. So we're very excited about this. We think this is going to be a great thing, and we look forward to participating in it. And I'll tell you, I appreciate Mike, your leadership on this, and the rest of the council in, in paying close attention, this is going to be a significant resource for this community, and we really look forward to participating in it. You Grow is a program to help connect people back to where the food comes from. We hear a lot of talk about gardens at schools and, and other places, but this is a way be, for us to get it to our participants. So many of these folks live in apartments, they live in mobile homes where they don't have a backyard that they can plow up and plant corn. or Angela's sunflowers. So now we come to them with uh, three to five gallon containers, some organic soil, starts that have been provided to us by the Dr. John Wilson Community Garden through Parks and Rec, and also from uh, Banner uh, Greenhouses. So this comes to us, people can learn about them, they can pick out and choose the, the plants that they want to have at their own home, and then they have access to a master gardener on a regular periodic basis throughout the course of the year in case they have issues growing their tomato plant or pepper plant or whatever it is. And to help them really understand that, it's been a significant, uh, it's been a significant program for us. And I'll give you another success story. We had a woman participate in last falls, we actually did it in September last year, who was suffering from severe depression. And we were concerned about her. And she came to the UGrow event, she chose her three plants, potted them, took them home, and knowing that she was responsible for the care of those plants lifted her up out of her depression because she was so committed to making sure that those plants thrived and were healthy that that was where she was able to refocus the negative things in her life. So it was really significant. Not something that we had planned on, but then again, one of those things that happens in the course of life. Our backpack program is a, is a, a local uh, community partnership. Uh, we, we pick up these packs from the Mana Food Bank. Uh, the Rotary Club here in Black Mountain uh, generates income that is passed on to uh, Black Mountain Savings Bank where the fresh fruits and vegetables, apples, oranges, bananas are packed in these packs of kid-friendly food and then distributed around to the, to the school children in the community. It's intended to help get these kids who are from a food insecure home over the course of the weekend so that they can be back at school on Monday ready to learn and nourished. The Latinx engagement program is one that since I spoke to you last we um, we took over some responsibility for from another group that was facilitating this. Uh, last October 26th we convened uh, an outreach to the Latinx community at the Owen Middle School. We invited 22 community partners to come and join us to talk to this community about resources that were available to them uh, we had 150 people attend. After that event, we convened a, a small group of people that were representative of that community and asked them, what is it you need? What do you need? And the, the feedback that came to us was <clears throat> they needed healthy food access, health and wellness resources. They wanted English as a second language classes. They wanted access to computer output. And they wanted activity, Zumba. So we have been able to help them. All of our resources are translated into Spanish, so all the recipes, all the health and wellness curriculum. Thursday evening at Owen Middle School and Friday at Black Mountain Ele Elementary School, the curriculum is delivered in Spanish. So we don't have any language barriers there. 
So we've been able to help them with that. We host, a, uh, we host the two Zumba classes. We host an English as a Second Language class at our facility on Friday evenings. And now we're adding a second one uh, because that's become so popular. What we want to do with this, because I will tell you honestly, this is a little bit of mission creep for Bounty and Soul. But 32% of our market participants are from the Latinx, Hispanic communities. We couldn't turn our back on. So we took on this responsibility. But our goal with this is to create a group of people, a steering committee, if you will, from within the community, work with them on some fundraising so that we can create another 501c3 that is specifically represented of them that will continue to cater to their needs. And then Bounty and Soul will become a support to them in our more mainline health and wellness, food resource kind of, a, of opportunity. So this, we've seen a significant increase in the Latinx population. Half of our Owen Middle School market is, Latina, is from this community, and now half of the Black Mountain Elementary School market is from this community, and it's growing. And it's not that we're advertising, it's that they're finding out about this resource, they know that when they see the Bounty and Soul logo on an event, it's a safe place for them to be. And so they're able to come, and they're able to get the assistance and the resources and the community that's so important to them. Angela? And I'll tell you, couldn't do it without the volunteers. Um, one of the things that's been so impressive and imp that has impressed me so much in the last year is just how much this community has embraced Bounty and Soul. It was started by a vision and a few willing volunteers at St. James Episcopal Church, and now it has grown to the point where we're doing five markets a week, distributing the pounds of food I showed you, 700 people, and growing at an at a almost scaringly rapid rate. But with our four paid employees at Bounty and Soul, they're Allie, Carla, the director of operations, Adam, the guy that drives the trucks and, and uh, wrangles volunteers, and I'm a part-time employee. Four employees and an army of 130 dedicated community volunteers, people from Montreat and Black Mountain and Swannanoa, who come to this to make sure this happens. Four employees, 130 volunteers. You can see how the work gets done. As a result, Bounty and Soul is a very, very cost-effective and efficient organization for sourcing, for distributing, and reaching out to the people in the community who struggle. This is a partial list of our partnerships. If I put them all up there, it would be mouse type. None of us could read it. These are some that I just wanted to call out and bring to your attention. Some of the different farmers and growers that are in the community, the churches, the schools, the businesses, and other organizations that are all in collaboration to meet the needs of the organization, uh, meet the needs of the community, my apologies. These are people who are active and on the front line every day of providing funds, providing volunteers, providing food to us, or providing us with opportunities and facilities where we can do the work of being able to ensure that the health of the community is protected and viable. Angela? So there we are. You'll see this in the handouts that you've got and how to get a hold of us. And what I would ask you is to, if you would please, I want to thank you for the time. But I also want to tell you, you got to come to a market. You got to come see this thing, Larry, right? Yeah. To really understand awesome. what goes on. Uh, Mike's been a great supporter of ours for the last three years. and truly appreciate that in a number of ways. And now with this partnership for the Carver Center, which we think is going to be big for the community, um, really invite you to come out and see this thing. Once you see it in action, and you see how it all gets done, and you, and you, are, able to, um, you are able to meet and see the people that are, that are in the community, you'll understand. Like I said earlier, one out of six people woke up this morning and didn't know if, how, when they would next eat a meal. In a community that suffers from food insecurity like that, the chances are high. We all know somebody who's hungry. We may not know they're hungry, but it's people that you engaged over the course of your day today that struggled in the morning and will struggle again tomorrow morning to put food on their table. So I want to thank you from Bounty and Soul for the opportunity to come in and report again. I'll be back a year from now. The numbers will change. The, the, the demographics will change of the people we serve. But the point is, we're not at a point where we're working ourselves out of a job. And it's actually going the other way. So I want to thank you. I want to invite you to come out and see us. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate it. OK, Matt, consent agenda. On the consent agenda, you've got uh, the adoption of minutes from uh, five meetings that you had in uh, in August and you have um, 
a budget amendment to eliminate negative cash uh, in the golf fund in the amount of seventy-one thousand nine hundred and ninety-seven dollars. And just as a as a reminder, two two things that go along with that: we did have we did budget for the upcoming year forty thousand dollars for um, additional improvements at our with our irrigation system in the pump house. That is actually included in this because the way um, the way we expensed it, it was in the it was in last fiscal year. So there is. A forty thousand. We we knew that that expense was going to come. We had budgeted for it this year. You no longer will have to have that expense in the upcoming year. So we are a little better off in the upcoming year. And I would and and I would also just remind you that that the uh, um, because of the way we do our, we do our accounting, the general fund does contribute thirty thousand dollars, or the golf fund contributes thirty thousand dollars to the general fund for the services provided um, from the from the general fund services that are provided back to the golf fund. So uh, and that is and that of course is included in in this uh, um, in this number for the uh, um, to reduce the or to eliminate the negative cash, and that's all you have for your consent agenda. All right, do I hear a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, obviously, don't have. Doesn't look like we got another citizen comment. So we have new business. And under new business, you have um, a utility easement for uh, Duke Energy uh, regarding um, a street light on uh, Chicago Avenue on the private portion of that. And actually, it's on the property um, where the, it's on the Carver Center property. So it's on town. It would, it would sit on town property. It's, uh, if you'll recall, from maybe six months or a year ago, I can't remember now. It's been a little while. We did allow a sewer easement for a couple of houses to be built at the end of, uh, of Chicago Avenue. And this is a street light that would then also uh, be situated um, on, on the private drive. It does it, 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 there's not an expense for the town. It's, it's a privately maintained street light, but they didn't have to have an easement from us to put it on, on the property that they're asking for. And the pole, ar the pole already exists on the property. That's Angela just reminded me of that. So that's, so really this is, all, this is really only about running underground line and putting a light on a pole that's already there. Do I hear a motion to approve it? So moved. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, opposed? Pass unanimously. Look like we have any public hearings? No, sir. So communication? <laughs> I have nothing for this board. Matt? I would, uh, and I would just looking out the window to see how the storm was doing. The only thing I would do is update, uh, update you and, and the, the people that are, that are here. Um, we are prepared for the storm. I think it is, it is you know, as we talked about at uh, the agenda meeting at the time, the path looked uh, really imminent that it was coming right in this direction. Now it has moved to the west, and so we're going to get rain and winds, although we've had some trees down already today, I, I believe. And so... Um, what I would what I would point out to the board and to the um, and to the public for for future reference when there are storms, we've reached out to uh, DOT, we've reached out to Duke Energy, we have a uh, um, the emergency services folks and and uh, public services and myself have met to get a plan together um, in case in, in case the in case it had been a larger storm than it is, we would obviously set up a command center at the police department. We would uh, move all town staff would work in 12-hour shifts to uh, to accommodate that command center, take phone calls, provide resources for things that, that we're able to do to help support the emergency services. Today, though, it's important that you know that all the, our equipment has been fueled up. Um, everybody is on, everybody that's on call is ready for um, um, for tree removal and and debris removal and, and emergency services as uh, as may be necessary. I would. Tell people that you know on the on the website, on our social media, um, we we provided a lot of information about shelters that uh, that if it if it was necessary, the Baptist Church has a shelter that the Christian Ministries is doing. Christ Mount has a shelter that uh, that they're offering, um, but that's really how we're getting the information out, and we're and we're prepared for that. I think now we're 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 treating it more as a um, severe storm event, and 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 using dispatch and, and responding to calls. Uh, but we are we were prepared um, in case of a larger event, and we will be prepared in the future, and we're prepared tonight to help people uh, get through it. I, my advice would be if you don't have to go out, don't go out. Stay home and, uh, and 
if the power goes out, there's there's resources there to to get that to get that done to get that uh, back. But uh, my advice would be stay home tonight and uh, through tomorrow, and then hopefully we will survive it, and we'll uh, and we'll clean up, and we'll keep everybody else in our prayers that uh, that is that has not been as fortunate as we as we might be for this this hurricane. Very good. Do I have any any alderman wish to say anything? I'd like to say that as far as the the uh, parking, the town has been working on the uh, parking situation for quite a while. I know that we had our intern uh, uh, working on that right before she left. Uh, we have Angela right now working on uh, several different uh, agreements and, and uh, cooperation with some of the churches to uh, make the uh, parking lots available for municipal parking and uh, hats off to the town for, for what they've been doing in, in, in that regard. We also have, Matt, um, we discussed this, I believe, on Friday, a uh, opportunity to apply for a grant. Does that fund, those funds come from the Department of Transportation? They do. Uh, they're similar to what we've done, bicycle grants and, uh, and right. pedestrian grants. Um, right. I talked to Lou Bozueva with uh, the French Broad River MPO. Um, that grant period opens up in October. It runs to the end of December. Uh, and they will do a, they'll do a planning study for, uh, for parking. They've broken it out. They used to do it. They it's used a little, to do it. I think, uh, I think she made the comment that it's a little more of a holistic study and that it doesn't take, and it takes into consideration parking. Did you have a chance to touch base with her on it? Yes, in circulation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so circulation and parking. And it looks at both of them together. So we have the opportunity to maybe make the application for that next month, right? That's right. But I think it would, it would, it would happen in, it happens in December. It opens up, the, the requests open up next month. Right. And then you can, you right. can apply off right. in December. Right. Which so, seems like a, a good, yeah. and, and, and So the funding for that, and I don't, she was going to um, send me some information on what, generally what that, right. kind of what the, right. what the price range right. might be. But the way it would right. break down is an 80-20 split, the way right. the DMT always right. does that for us. But just to point out a little yes. bit what Don was saying, that there's, you know, that, I think that's a very positive direction to move into just to, to have the have that study done and I believe the requirement was that you still you needed to pursue some work with the consultant after the work of the study but it doesn't mean you implement what you have to implement but you still pursue one you know want some more additional consultation work afterward but it looked like a pretty positive I think there's an opportunity pretty positive, there, certainly, so pretty positive thing to look at yes sir and we're looking at that now well, that's good that we're looking at that. It's, it's, it certainly has taken a while because we've been, we, we've kind of left this thing, uh, this has been just left aside for months and months and months. So um, this, is, this is good news to hear. I still think this Blue Ribbon Committee can come back and can work in conjunction with these, with these folks and giving uh, suggestions. I still think one of the simplest things that we could do is just to build a, a, a deck right on the other side of the railroad tracks we could accommodate 100 cars in there, uh, run us about $17,000 a spot. I think that's something that we need to consider. Anyway, nothing else? Meeting adjourned.